In today's lecture, we will speak about the Ariya Satya, the Noble Truths. This is a change in name, not a change in the subject matter. We're only changing the name, we haven't changed the subject that we'll be talking about. We are talking about Buddhism in all its aspects, in all its dimensions. We can talk about Buddhism as a religion, or as culture, or as civilization. We can talk about Batit about Buddhism. We can call it Baticha Samupada. We can call it the Noble Truths. We can change the name with which we label what we're talking about, but we're always talking about just one thing because there's only one subject, there's only one issue of relevance. So whether we call it Buddhism, culture, civilization, religion, Paticca Samupada, Ariya Satya, or whatever, we're always talking about just the one thing, and that is the quenching <clears throat> of suffering. We can even talk about it as a theism in a theistic way, as a way of, of getting to God. We can talk about Buddhism as a way of reaching God. God in the sense of being the, the highest thing, the supreme thing. When we speak in terms of Paticca Samupada, we're talking in a scientific way. We're discussing the law of nature. When we talk about the Ariya Satya, the Noble Truths, we're then talking about certain truths or facts which can, which can extinguish suffering. Whether we talk, whether we call it the big Noble Truths or the little Noble Truths, it's, it's the same subject matter just a slightly different angle on this issue. It's somewhat amusing that people use this word Buddhism in a material way. You, if there are lots of temples and pagodas and stupas and a lot of men running around wearing yellow cloths, then they say that Buddhism is thriving. But if these things are, are in short supply, then they say that Buddhism is deteriorating. <coughs> this is to use the word Buddhism in a merely material way, which is a bit ridiculous. So now we'll talk about the Ariya Satya, Four Noble Truths. These are truths which have supreme benefit, which have the most benefit for human beings. As we mentioned earlier, when we talk about Paticca Samupada, it's quite long and detailed. So it's, it has a, ten, a tendency to be theoretical. But when we speak of the Ariya Sancha, there's not so much left. And so it's very practical. <coughs> Today we'll be speaking about these noble truths as something very, very practical. These four noble truths are of the most important. They have great relevancy and great value for our lives. This point can be emphasized by a, a passage in the scriptures where the Buddha was walking through a forest. 
and he picked up a, a handful of leaves. And then he asked the monks who he was, he told the monks he was with that his knowledge, all the things a Buddha knows, are like all the leaves in the forest, or even like a world full of leaves, if all the leaves in the world. And then he said, but all that the Buddha teaches are just these, this handful of leaves, are like just this handful of leaves. This is a comparison he made with the Four Noble Truths. So we ought to learn about the Four Noble Truths, especially as they are something, it's, the Four Noble Truths are very concise. There's nothing complicated or interwoven or messed up or tangled or anything about the Four Noble Truths. They're very short, quick, direct, to the point, very concise. Nonetheless, they're sufficient. Not too much and not too little. They're enough, just sufficient for our needs, this, this one handful of leaves. And still, it's something most necessary for all sentient beings, for all beings that still experience misery and suffering. They, this knowledge of the Four Noble Truths is most necessary. On one hand, we can say that the Arya Satcha is the meeting, is the collection of the, in, of all or the whole teachings. On the other hand, we can say it's the heart of Buddhism. So this one handful of leaves, we can both say that it's the collection of it all, of the whole of Buddhism. On the other hand, it's the heart, the heart of Buddhism. Further, we can say that it is the essence of morality and also the essence of ultimate truth. The Four Noble Truths are the essence of both relative, conventional truth, as well as the essence of transcendent, ultimate truth. The essence, or we could also say the nucleus of both morality and ultimate truth. Now we'll talk about the words Ariya Satya. First, the word satya, it means truth. If we're speaking of truth, there can only be one truth. For each thing or subject we might talk about, there can only be one truth. By truth, we mean that which does not deceive, that which doesn't confuse. This one truth also is firmly established in, or it doesn't change. This one truth is firmly established and does not change. This is what we mean by the word satya, an undeceiving, unchanging, certain, firmly established truth. There's a short verse in the scriptures that goes, Ekang hi satyang matuti yamati. Truth is one, there is, there is no second. This is the <laughs> definition of truth. And now the word ariya, which we're talking about how it is understood in Buddhism, not the Aryans of, of Sanskrit in other places, 
but Arya in Buddhism comes from Ari, which means enemy, and Ya, which means to go. So Arya means to go, to go away from one's enemies. This means to go out from all problems, to go away from all, all misery, all pain, all suffering. This is Arya as it is understood in Buddhism. If we look at things from the point of view of history, we can see it as a kind of spiritual civilization. In Thai, the word Arya, which is the Sanskrit version of Arya, is used in the word civilization. This is why it's often translated as noble. But in the Arya Sajja, this is, can also be called a kind of civilization, but it's a spiritual civilization, not the ordinary kind. And so in Buddhism we use this word with the sense of excellence. There's nothing more excellent than this. There's no truth that has as excellent, has the excellence of the noble truths. There's nothing which has as value which is as excellent. This is the most excellent truth. This is why we call it the noble truth. One reason we say excellent is because it's universal or even more than universal. These noble truths are applicable, are true in any time, in any place, in any age, in any location. Whether, a th whether in the past or a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand million years into the future, wherever there are sentient beings, the noble truths are, are true. Wherever in all time and space, in the universe or beyond the universe, or in all the universes, however many they might be, the noble truths are true for all sentient beings, for all beings that experience When we talk about the Ariyasat in short and concise form, we can talk about it in the following way. The Ariyasatya are simply talking about dukkha, about suffering, and asking these four questions, or examining dukkha from these four aspects. What is it? What is it? Where does it come from? What is its purpose? And what is the method of achieving that purpose? These are the four aspects with which dukkha is illuminated. What is it? Where does it come from? What is its purpose? And what is the method of realizing that purpose? These four aspects or methods are not limited simply to the, the matter of dukkha. Anything, any issue, any reality that is to be examined can be investigated using these four methods. What is it? Where does it come from? What is its purpose? What is the method of achieving its purpose? Anything can be looked at in this way, not just, not just the very important issue of dukkha. The noble truths are essentially a mental thing, a spiritual issue, but still those four, four methods can be used with material things 
as well. When we come to the subject of dukkha, it's important that we have we approach it as a spiritual thing. And so when we ask, what is it? It's not necessary to ask anyone else what what is suffering. Instead, just look within ourselves and have a direct make a direct spiritual experience of of the reality of of dukkha. And then, where does it come from? You don't have to read any books to find this out. Just use that same inner experience and know for yourself how dukkha arises, where it comes from. And then what is the purpose of dukkha? There's no need to rely on anyone else to tell us. Dukkha itself, if there's a direct experience of it, will reveal to us what the purpose of suffering is. And then the way out of suffering. We can find this within ourselves, discover it personally, directly, by looking, looking within ourselves. So all of these Four Noble Truths are to be studied within as spiritual experience. So the Four Noble Truths are used for the spiritual matter of, of suffering. But we can still use these four, four angles for something material, such as this microphone. To, to know the microphone, we must find out what is it? What is this thing? And where does it come from? What kind of actions or activities made this microphone? And then what is its purpose? And then what, what method or technique or means do we need to be able to use it, to utilize it properly? Even, even things which are neither material or spiritual, such as family. If one is going to understand family, one must use the Arya Sacha method. What is it? What is family? Where does family come from? What is the point? What is the meaning? What is the value of family? And what must we do that family will be successful, will be beneficial? Anything, everything should be understood using the method of the Noble Truth. These, we call this the Noble Truth's way of thinking. Thinking according to the method of the Noble Truth. This is completely based in natural <coughs> principles according to the law of nature. So we can use this method of the Noble Truth, this way of thinking, for anything that's part of nature, for every bit and particle of nature, whether we're talking about things or objects or activities or whatever. Everything within nature can be examined and understood using this method of the Noble Truth. When you've seen these things for yourself, then you'll know for yourself whether they're noble or not. You'll understand why we use the word noble, and you'll be able to see whether there is anything more noble than these noble truths. This is what we mean by the word noble. Now we come to the word for. The Buddha insisted that this was fixed, that we shouldn't take away any of, any of them and we shouldn't add in any new ones. We should neither increase nor decrease the noble truths. 
the number four is fixed. It's certain. And so we, the Buddhists said that there are four and only four. Which of them could you take away? If you took any of the four away so that there was only three, there would be a hole, a gap. There would be something missing. And so it, they wouldn't function properly. They wouldn't be completely successful. Or if we added another one, a fifth, then it would just confuse things. It would make things complicated. It would just cause a bunch of problems and hassles for no benefit. That fifth, fifth one would just be extra. And so it's of no value to lessen or increase the noble truth. There are just these four. What is it? Where does it come from? What is its purpose? And how do we go about realizing that purpose? There's just these four truths. We ought to apply these truths to the most important thing we've got. We ought to apply them to life. What is life? Where does life come from? What is the purpose, the meaning of life? How are we going to fulfill that purpose in our lives? If we can apply this method of the Noble Truth successfully to life, then we'll have a life that has no problems, no hassles. There are many who don't know the purpose for which they were born. Many people don't know why they were born. What's the meaning of being born? And so they have no opportunity. There's, they don't have any chance of realizing that purpose, realizing the meaning of life. This is because they don't know about, <coughs> they don't utilize the third noble truth. What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? What is the benefit that we ought to get from life? If we don't know this, then it's impossible for us to realize that thing, to realize that which is the purpose, the meaning of life. This is what happens if we don't understand the Third Noble Truth. If you don't know these Noble Truths, then life and suffering will be the same thing. For those who don't understand these, these four truths, their lives are just a bunch of suffering. But if one knows these truths, understands them thoroughly, then one can separate life from suffering. Then life and suffering become completely different things. Life, through knowing the Four Noble Truths, life has nothing to do with suffering anymore. Not knowing these truths Suffering and life are the same thing. Through knowing the truths, life and, and suffering are completely separated, are completely divorced from each other. Schopenhauer, the, the German philosopher, when he studied Buddhism, he got the idea that life was suffering. He thought Buddhism was saying life is suffering. And so then he categorized Buddhism as pessimistic. And so Schopenhauer got Buddhism all wrong. He completely missed the boat. Because there's nothing pessimistic about Buddhism in the least. Just because Buddhism talks about suffering doesn't mean it's, that's all it does. Buddhism not only talks about suffering, it talks about the, the way, or talks about the quenching of suffering and the way to quench all suffering. 
So there's, there's nothing pessimistic about this. If one understands the Four Noble Truths, one has the means to free life from suffering. So to say that life is suffering is incredibly, incredibly superficial. With the Noble Truths, life doesn't have to have any suffering at all. So there's no way that we could say that this is pessimistic. On the other hand, it wouldn't be correct to call it optimistic either, because we're not getting, we're not indulging in any, in our hopes and wishes. Instead, Buddhism is just natural truth. Buddhism isn't concerned with being pessimistic or optimistic. It's only concerned with the truth, with the truth that is in the middle, that is neither pessimistic nor optimistic. Through knowing the Four Noble Truths, life can be freed from all suffering. So, don't go, don't go thinking this system of the Noble Truths is pessimistic. If you view it in that way, you won't be able to use them for your own benefit. The Four Noble Truths are the way of freeing life from suffering, so there's nothing pessimistic there. Instead, they're, they're in the middle. Because the Four Noble Truths are, are in the middle, they can solve the, the pessimistic part, or the part that is taken to be pessimistic. And then the aspect that is considered to be optimistic, this can be realized only because the Four Noble Truths are right there in the middle, in truth. If they, the truth, these were actually pessimistic, they could have no, no realization of what is, op, they could not lead to realization of the, the optimistic part. Or if they were optimistic, they couldn't, they couldn't deal with the, the so-called pessimistic part. But because the Noble Truths are in the middle, they can, they can completely liberate life from all misery and dukkha. And so when you are studying and practicing the noble truth, you must have a life which is in the middle. When we're living in the middle, it's not so difficult to understand and utilize the Four Noble Truths. By living in the middle, we mean a life that avoids two extremes. The extreme of, there are these rather large poly words used to explain these extremes. The first one is Gamma Sukhali Ga Nu Yo, which means to be caught up in sensual pleasures, to be indulging in pain. This means the life of, of luxury the life of chasing after fun, games, and pleasure. The other extreme is atakila which means to get caught up in, in inflicting pain on oneself. This is the life of austerities, the life of indulging in pain, in making needless hassles and problems for oneself. So one is the life of luxury, and one is the life of austerity. These are two extremes which will prevent us from finding the noble truth. So we ought to live in the middle. Through living in the middle, things go much more easily, and we are able to realize truths that are very profound and deep such as the truth, the fact of anatta, not self, of which people are, tend to get a little bit frightened. There's two other words that are much shorter and easier to understand. The one way of life is the way of life that is dry, parched, burning. The dry way of life. 
And the other way of life is wet. It's soggy, mildewed. And so almost fermenting, it's so wet. So there are these two, two extremes. The one that is dry, hot, and burning. And the other one that is, is wet and fermenting. These are the two extremes to be avoided and to have a life that is instead in the middle. Can we use the words the burning life and the, the soaking life? Are these, if these help you to understand this, then remember them, the burning life and the soaking life. Life that is burning, burnt by austerities, in the life that is soaking in luxuries and, and pleasures. And so please forgive us that we, we ask you while staying here to live, live in the middle. In order to understand the noble truths, we ask that you live in a, a middle way, not to, not to go off indulging in things like cigarettes or sneaking sweets and eating delicious food all the time. We ask that you neither live in a way that is too comfortable or too uncomfortable, too easy or too difficult. And so we sit up, we set up a structure and there's a discipline or a, an order that we ask everyone to follow in order that we're living in the middle, which makes it easy to understand the Four Noble Truths. Please don't think that the lifestyle here is, is one of austerities, that sleeping on a hard floor and eating only two meals a day and the kind of food we have here. We hope that you don't understand these to be ascetic practices or anything like that. There's nothing austere about this kind of lifestyle. It's sufficient. It's enough to maintain good health. With, it's not inflicting any needless pains or difficulties. And it's not indulging in pleasures as well. It's, it's sufficient. It's good enough. In fact, in the Buddha's time, the monks lived under much more difficult conditions. They didn't have dormitories or, or houses or anything. They spent a lot of time sleeping in the open at the bases of trees, <coughs> eating only one meal a day, often very poor quality food. And that was enough, good enough for them to live, the, in, a, live in the middle and realize the Four Noble Truths. And so the, the lifestyle here and the, the discipline here, the structure here, is it's sufficient, it's good enough. There's nothing austere or ascetic about it. Or in one, in one short sentence, live intimately with nature. This is living intimately with nature. When we're close to nature, it's an easy matter to understand the Four Noble Truths. These truths are all about nature. If we live in a way that separates from us from nature, it's very difficult to understand these truths. These truths about nature, the law of nature, the duty to be lived according to that law of nature. This is why we live in this way. We, we hope you can understand this point and then you'll be most, you'll accept this lifestyle quite willingly. In Thai, what I translated as living intimately with nature is a little more literally as live as an intimate comrade of nature, or the word is glu, <laughs> and Ajahn Buddhadasa wants this word to be explained very carefully. To be a glu 
is much more than to be just a friend, just an ordinary friend. A glue, glue are really close, really tight, inseparable, born together, living together, and ev even dying together. We need to have this, this intimate relationship with nature, to be intimate comrades with nature in order to understand the noble truth. So we've spent an hour talking about the Four Noble Truths already. That's enough. Now we'll talk, we'll move on to the first of the Noble Truths. The first Noble Truth is the truth of Dukkha. Du, du means hard or difficult, means difficult. Ka or kama, ka or kama means to endure, to bear. So dukkha means difficult to endure, difficult to bear. This is the meaning, this is a meaning of dukkha. It's difficult to bear and so it's necessary for us to, to deal with it. It's difficult to bear and so we have to solve this this situation. In fact, it's the thing that makes us struggle and fight. This thing that's making us struggle and fight all the time. This is the condition of dukkha. A second meaning, a second etymology of dukkha is du can mean ugly, hateful. Ka comes from ika, which means to see. To look and see is ika. So, du and ika, dukkha, is to, to see it as ugly, see its ugliness, to see the hatefulness. This is another meaning of dukkha. And because when, if we see it, it's ugly, if it's this way, if it's, this, if it's ugly and hateful, then it's very difficult to endure. If we really see this thing, if we really get to the thing we call dukkha, then we'll see how ugly it is, how disgusting it is. And then we won't be able to bear it. It's just too much of a hassle, too much trouble. And so we'll, we'll need to solve this problem. We'll need to, to deal with it somehow. But the problem here, or the, the trickiness here, is that, that dukkha can be deceptive. It can deceive us into thinking that it's something desirable. There are forms or versions or variations of dukkha which we tend to love, that we, we get infatuated with. And so we ne this makes it difficult to see the ugliness, the hatefulness of dukkha. And if we don't see that repulsiveness, then we may not take the measures we need to to get free of it. So, it's important to see dukkha, the real dukkha, and see its ugliness, its, its hatefulness. So, be, because of this deceptiveness of dukkha, we don't see that certain things are ugly and disgusting. Things like addictive drugs, or gambling, or, or irresponsible sex. We don't see these things as ugly. Instead, we see them as desirable and we fall in love with these things. And by falling in love with them, the dukkha keeps tormenting us. But we can't get free because we're in love with these things. We don't, even, we don't know what the problem is and we don't even know that we ought to, to solve the problem. But if we see the ugliness <coughs> of, this, of this suffering, of these things, then 
then we're willing to get free of them and then we can deal with the problem. Then we stop loving these things which are in fact causing us trouble and killing us. When we were when we were a child and we we heard something and we we still hear it these days even that if one is a farang that means a, a white European or a person a white person of European descent one must drink whiskey or or brandy whichever one one prefers one has to be drinking whiskey and, or brandy and living in a, lux, a luxurious way and so we wonder if what what the what is happening for the the farangs if if they're able to see the ugliness of these things or if they're they're just thoroughly deceived by things like whiskey and luxurious lifestyles if they're still deceived by these things then they've got no chance of getting free of of escaping from the suffering that these things bring they're still in love with all this luxury then their situation doesn't have much hope but if on the other hand they can see the ugliness and the hatefulness of such things then they have the possibility of getting free of solving the problem and being liberated from dukkha so this is very important to see this the second meaning of dukkha that if you see it it's ugly it's hateful we need to see that a luxurious life is really disgusting it's it has absolutely no value and it it's a waste of so many things it's really disgusting if we see it in this way then we'll have no problems with it but if we see it instead as lovely as attractive as desirable then it's just going to make a mess for us if we love a life of luxury then then we're in a very sad position so it's very important to see the disgusting repulsive aspect of the the repulsiveness of the and the horribleness of a luxurious life then there's a third meaning do still means ugly hateful kan comes from the word kan which means vacant or empty like this this empty space here in pali can be called kan this kan is to be empty of any essence completely vacant there's no value no benefit nothing desirable there at all no no essence no no meaning no anything this is the meaning of kan and so dukkha means vacant in this disgusting way disgustingly vacant hatefully hatefully empty meaning absolutely no value no meaning no purpose no benefit no essence nothing worthwhile in the least this this is the third meaning of dukkha these are the three meanings of dukkha the first difficult to endure the second seeing it it's ugly see it as ugly or when it's seen it's ugly and the third is hatefully vacant disgustingly vacant these three meanings explain the word dukkha quite thoroughly the first was are were in the words of the buddha the buddha explained dukkha in this way himself the second and third meanings are found in the commentaries written after the buddha's time 
but even though they aren't the direct words of the Buddha, they, they're valuable and they have very important meaning. So we're, we can use them. They're of practical benefit. So then altogether we can use these three meanings of the word dukkha. In summary, this is, dukkha is the thing that that disturbs and destroys our, our peacefulness. Dukkha is what comes in and disrupts our, our natural peacefulness. It interferes with peacefulness. And so it's very difficult to put up with. It's really a hassle to endure this dukkha which is destroying peace. So dukkha is what causes the problems. Dukkha is the, the source of all problems that makes life, that makes things so difficult, makes things such a hassle. And it's this, so dukkha is in, it, is in fact itself the problem. Dukkha is that which, which disrupts, disturbs, destroys peacefulness and then makes, makes life so often difficult to endure because there's no peacefulness then. When, when it's disrupting peacefulness, we have to fight and struggle. And this is very difficult. It's a real hassle to be struggling all the time. So this is the problem. This is the cause of, of all problems, this thing we call dukkha. So then we come to the, the question, what, what technical term are we going to use in English? In Thai there's no difficulty because in Thai they've used this word dukkha for centuries. In Thai they pronounce it tuk, tuk, and this is a word everybody knows. So in Thai there's no need to translate dukkha into a different word. They've already got, they already are using dukkha in their language. But in English, dukkha is a strange and unknown word. And so then we have the question, how are we going to translate it? What, what word or term in English could we use? Not only in English, but German, French, Spanish, Japanese and all the other languages. What, what is the proper translation of, of dukkha? We've gone through the various meanings. What word would capture the meaning? This is something that you, you can probably, you ought to think about quite a bit. It will, what word should we translate it with? Often the most common word is suffering, but it's really not a good enough translation. It, it's only part of the matter. Dukkha is much broader than just suffering. Or painfulness is too narrow. Misery is, is too narrow. So what word can we use to translate dukkha? Somebody suggested the word this satisfactoriness in all its aspects. And Ajahn Buddha Dasa feels that that captures the, the meaning, but it's a little long. <laughs> so maybe he thought maybe I'd have a better suggestion and I'm still working on it. So we can all give some thought to this. How are we going to translate the word dukkha with a word that captures the entire meaning, not just a little part of it. Because people have been using the word suffering often and it's, it's just, it's too narrow. People who don't learn the full meaning of dukkha then have quite a bit of confusion about the Four Noble Truths. So we need to find a, a term that really does the, the word dukkha justice. And so we, we request, we, we suggest that you just use the word dukkha. 
we ought to introduce the word dukkha into the English language, the German language, the French language, and all the other languages of the world. This would be of great service to humanity if everybody became aware of the word dukkha and all, all its implications and meanings. Because if, if we don't, if you specifically or anyone else doesn't understand dukkha correctly, then you don't have any chance of understanding Buddhism. To understand Buddhism properly and fully, one has to have a complete understanding of the word dukkha. Now we'll talk about dukkha in terms of the body. We'll begin with physical dukkha, or dukkha related to the body. Dukkha, then, are things which are problems. Actually, the Pali in Thai word is banha, which can be translated both problem and question. So this is another word that's not so easy to translate. But anything that is a problem, which is a difficulty, this for the body or regarding the body, this we call dukkha. And so we talk about birth, getting old, illness, and death. These, these are dukkha. These are, these are problems re related to the body. When we talk about birth, birth means that there is, there is existence. And in existence, we have to fight and struggle to, to find food, clothing, shelter, medicine. Existence is a constant struggle and fight in order to maintain life. So this is the problems we're talking about. Because there is birth, there, is, there has to be all this, this struggling, this this working and sweating and dealing and trading and all kinds of things in order to maintain life. So this is the problems that arise from birth. And it's very difficult to endure all this. This is the first meaning of dukkha, having to endure all this struggle. The next condition is that of, of age or aging. And the meaning of this word is literally <coughs> constantly flowing, constantly flowing, constantly changing, or impermanence. Because existence is impermanent, because it's constantly flowing, it's very difficult to maintain. And it's always changing and getting into new difficulties, new hassles, new, new problems. Because of this constant flowing of, of existence, this impermanence of existence, it's very difficult to endure. There's no stability in it. There's no security. The next condition or symptom of dukkha is, is disease. Disease, we mean both injury and, and illness. Disease has three levels. The first is the one people are quite aware of. It's physical disease, physical illness. The body gets injured, it gets sick, and there are all kinds of diseases. Until nowadays, there is the very frightening disease of, of AIDS. These are all physical diseases. Then there's mental diseases, and then there's spiritual disease. So there are the three levels of disease, physical, mental, and spiritual. Now, although most people are more concerned with physical disease, this, this shouldn't be really such a big issue, because it's only occasionally 
that were physically sick. But spiritual disease, spiritual disease is happening every minute. Every hour of our life there is spiritual disease arising. This is the real, the real problem, this spiritual disease, because it's, it's with us most of the time. Physical disease just comes and goes. It's not such a big problem. And we're, modern science is fairly able to, to deal with it. So this, this is a third symptom of dukkha. The illnesses, injuries, and disease of the, the body, mind, and spirit. The mind, when we talk about spiritual disease, what we mean is that the mind isn't at peace. The mind can't be at peace. It's going, it's, it's vibrating, it's bouncing back and forth from positive to negative to positive to negative, negative to positive. It can never be at peace. It's just getting, bouncing back and forth like a, a ping pong ball or something between positive and negative. This is spiritual disease. We, most of us have good physical health, but when it comes to mental and spiritual health, we're in pretty bad shape. This is the, the third symptom of dukkha, the disease. If one has a physical disease, one should go to an ordinary hospital that deals with such things. If someone has mental disease, then they should go to a psychiatric hospital that deals with neuroses and all those kind of things. But if one has spiritual disease, then one must go to the hospital of the Buddha. The only place that can cure spiritual disease is the Buddha's hospital. Do you know where this hospital is? Have you ever heard of it before and are you able to find it? Because it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that we've got spiritual disease all the time. We've got this disease. Do we know where the hospital is that can cure it? So there are these three kinds of disease and there are the three hospitals which can cure it. We hope, we hope you can find the hospital that you need. If anyone asks, well, well where is the, the Buddha's hospital? We can reply that understanding the Four Noble Truths. This is the Buddha's hospital. Knowing the Four Noble Truths is the hospital which will cure spiritual disease. In the Buddha's hospital, the head doctor, the director, is the Buddha himself. The Buddha is the director of the hospital. And then the Dhamma is the medicine, the cure, which is given to the patients. And then the Sangha are the doctors, the nurses, and all the workers who, who assist the Buddha in that hospital. And then the physical building of the hospital, the physical structure of the hospital is the religion. This is the, the hospital of the Buddha. One of the awakened, the awakened beings, one of the Arahants, is recorded in the oldest scriptures to have said, Mahagaruni ko maihangsata sapaloka digichako, which means, my teacher has great compassion and cures the disease of all beings in all worlds. My teacher has great compassion and is the, the doctor 
who administers, who cures all the diseases of beings in all the worlds. And he was referring, of course, to the Buddha. The word here that is, is used as doctor, it was then, and we can translate it as doctor, now is dikichako, dikichako, which means one who solves, one who solves or one who cures, the solver, the curer. So the literal meaning is, is more than just a doctor. So one ought to be interested in finding this hospital of the Buddha that is able to cure all diseases, all the diseases of all beings. One ought to look carefully until one discovers this hospital. And so now that we know where the, the Buddha's hospital is, we need to, to go there whenever we get sick. And because we're we're get, we're, we catch the spiritual disease every second. We have to go to the Buddha's hospital every second. We need mindfulness. We need very good mindfulness to take us to the hospital, the Buddha's hospital, every time we catch the spiritual disease, which is, which is just about every second. We were just talking about the problem and now we're going to talk about the symptoms or the products of that problem. We'll go through them one by one, symptom by symptom. The first is soka, sorrow, and then body tewa, body tewa, which means, <laughs> is translated lamentation, which yeah. means a kind of wailing and moaning. Yeah. Spiritual crying. And then dukkha, in this case meaning physical pain. And then domanasa, which is mental pain or grief. And upayasa, mm -hmm. so a dry heart, often translated despair. Then being separation from the things we love, experiencing the things we don't like not getting what we want. These are the, mm -hmm. the symptoms or the manifestations mm -hmm. of dukkha. This is how d we experience dukkha. You need to know all of these symptoms, all these manifestations of dukkha because they're happening very often in your lives, in just ordinary life, even in a peaceful place like this you're experiencing all these manifestations of, of dukkha. So it's necessary that you, you know sorrow, spiritual crying, physical pain, mental pain, the dry heart, separation from the beloved, experiencing the disliked, not getting what we want. There are these eight, eight symptoms of dukkha. Really, you could make a longer list if you want, but just get to know the, this, the reality of these things. When, usually when people catch some illness, they cry and they feel sorry for themselves and they, they ask people to help them. Some even ask God to help. Oh, please help me, please help me. I'm so sick, I'm so miserable. But for the Buddhist, when there's any illness, we instead, instead of asking for someone to help us, we just go to the Buddha's hospital. Mindfulness, the mindfulness that we've been training, that has been very well trained through anapanasati, that mindfulness takes us to the Buddha's hospital, which is a thorough understanding of the Four Noble Truths. We don't have to <coughs> cry or feel sorry for ourselves. So, a complete, thorough understanding, perfect understanding of the Four Noble Truths. This is the Buddha's hospital. Now, in, in 
in brief, all dukkha comes down to what the Buddha called Sankidena Bachupada Nakanda Dukkha, which means all dukkha is comes down to attachment in the five khandas. The five khandas are the five primary basic functions of life. Body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. Body is easy to understand. Vedana feeling we've talked about already. Perceptions, thought, and vijnana, sense consciousness. Attaching to any of these is dukkha. This is the essence of dukkha, the heart of dukkha. The pancha, panchupadana khanda dukkha. Dukkha is the five khandas which are attached to. Excuse us for saying so, and we're not trying to be insulting or demeaning or anything, but we we feel it's necessary to to tell you, and not meaning any insult or anything, that none of you know the five khandas. Nobody knows the five khandas. And nobody knows, that means that nobody knows themselves. The five khandas are just our own lives. The fi- we are the five khandas. Nobody knows what the five khandas are. That means nobody even knows themselves. And if we don't know the five khandas, then we, we don't know, we don't understand, we don't see how we are attaching to them. Sometimes we're attaching to rupa khanda, the body function. And sometimes we're attaching to vetana khanda, the feeling function. And sometimes we're, we're, we're grabbing onto, identifying with the sanya khanda, the perceptions, perceiving things as this, as that, or whatever. Sometimes we're attaching to sankara khanda, the thoughts, the thought processes. And at other times we're, we're attaching to vijnana khanda, the, the sense consciousness function. We're attaching to these different things almost all the time. But because we don't even know ourselves, we don't, we don't even realize this. We don't even see the khandas themselves. If it wasn't for the khandas, there could be no dukkha. But because, but the khandas themselves are not dukkha when we attach to the khandas, that is dukkha. If we don't find out who and what we are and get to know what these khandas are, then we have very little, then we'll never know what dukkha is and we'll be unable to solve this problem. If we attach to one khanda or another, as I or mine. That's the problem, that's dukkha. There's no attaching, no identifying with the one or other of the khandas as I or mine. There's there's no problem. Birth, aging, illness, and death. These are just activities of the khandas. If we're not clinging to any of the khandas as I or mine, then there's no birth, aging, illness, or death. And so these things, there's no problem. There's birth, aging, illness, and death are not suffering. But because we cling to the the khandas, one or the other or all of them all together, as I and mine, then we've got my birth, my my aging, my illness, my death, and these things become suffering. And then the, the symptoms of 
Soga Bari Deva Dukkha Domanatsa Upadyasa Sorrow, sorrow, spiritual crying, physical pain, mental pain, and despair. All these kind of symptoms are just symptoms of the five khandas. They're they're not ours. And so if these if there's no clinging to the khandas as I in mind, these are just symptoms of the khandas. They're not my problem. They're not our problem. And so there's no dukkha. But only by clinging to the khandas do these these things become suffering. We ought to know the difference between the mere ordinary khandas, the khandas where there's no attachment involved, and the upadana khandas, the khandas with upadana, the khandas that are attached to. The ordinary khandas, the, the regular mere khandas, there's no problem whatsoever. They just function naturally as a living being. And there's, there's no suffering involved. But as soon as there is attachment to any of the khandas, then immediately suffering arises. The problem isn't the khandas, the problem is the attachment to the khandas. If you, ever, if you notice any dukkha at any time, then look and you'll see that there is attachment to one of the khandas. Without exception, all suffering, all misery, all pain, all grief, and all these things, <coughs> happen because of attachment to one or the other of the khandas. And so this is why the Buddha said that all forms of dukkha, every possible form without any exception, is basically attaching to the khandas. So please be careful to distinguish between the, the two kinds of khandas, the, the mere khandas, or we could call it when there's no attachment, or the, the blank khandas, or the free khandas, the khandas that aren't involved, aren't, in, aren't caught up with attachment in the least bit. And then the khandas which are engaged, the khandas which are attached, the khandas then that are busy because of attachment. We should be able to tell the difference between the two. If there's just the khandas, if the khandas are free and natural, there's no suffering. As soon as there's attachment, as soon as the khandas get involved, get busy, then there's suffering. With attachment, there's suffering. Without attachment, no suffering. It's, it's very simple. It's very cut and dried. This, this is the essence of the, the first noble truth, the noble truth of dukkha. So to put it quite briefly, there's the, the khandas of vicha, of correct knowledge, and the khandas of avicha, of ignorance, of stupidity. The vicha khandas are khandas that are known correctly regarding the Four Noble Truths. If there's knowledge of the Four Noble Truths taking place with these khandas, then they're free khandas. If there's no understanding or insufficient understanding or incorrect understanding of the Four Noble Truths, then those are ignorant khandas. So we've got knowing khandas and ignorant khandas. If we're, if we're ignorant of the Four Noble Truths, then the entire world all the things in the world, whether physical or mental, all these things, the, the whole world, becomes a burden for us. 
creates tremendous suffering for us. But if we, if we have vicha, correct knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, then there's no burden. There's no weight on our minds. Everything is free. This is the, the understanding of Dukkha Ariya Satcha, the noble truth of Dukkha. So once again, when we, when we attach to one of the khandas uh, as I or mine, right then, right there, is Dukkha. When there's no attaching to any of the khandas, there's no dukkha anywhere. This is the first noble truth. And we view time is, is up, and so we'll finish the lecture on this note.